This is Dr. Joshua Cooper, and I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist. That means I'm a heart doctor who specializes in the electrical system of the heart. The heart uses tiny electrical signals to tell it when to beat, and that electrical system can malfunction in a variety of ways. The purpose of this video is to talk about one of the most common arrhythmias called atrial fibrillation. So let's get started. In order to understand what atrial fibrillation is, I think it's really important to first have a sense of what the heart looks like. You may know that the heart has four parts to it, but it's mostly important to think about the heart as a top half and a bottom half, and you'll see why. The top half of the heart is made up of two atria. Each one is called an atrium and those act like receiving chambers. Blood comes through veins into those top two chambers, and then it will spill down into the bottom half of the heart, which we'll discuss in a moment. But those receiving chambers in the top half have very thin walls and not a lot of muscle, so that when they squeeze in any type of heart rhythm, we can't feel them. So they're sort of operating silently. You're never aware if the top half is going fast or slow or whatever. That's the bottom half that we're feeling, as we'll review in a moment. The bottom half of the heart are known as ventricles. Each one is a single ventricle. And those are the pumping chambers. They have very thick walls, very strong muscle, so that when they squeeze and they send blood out into the lungs and out to the rest of the body through arteries, we absolutely can feel them pumping. In fact, if you were to feel the artery in your neck or the pulse in your wrist, or feel the heart beating in your chest, all of what you're feeling there is the bottom half of the heart squeezing with its strong muscle. If you use a heart monitor or a heart watch or anything that tells you what your heart rate is, what that's recording again is only the bottom half of the heart. And that gets very important when we then talk about atrial fibrillation, heart rate, and different types of treatment, which we'll get into for atrial fibrillation. Top half, receiving chambers, cannot feel it. Bottom half, pumping chambers, they create the pulse and the heart rate. When the heart is beating in its normal rhythm, the top and bottom halves cooperate. First the top chamber squeeze and then the bottom. Top, bottom, top, bottom. That's the normal heartbeat. Let's get into the difference between the normal heartbeat, known as sinus rhythm, and atrial fibrillation. In order to do that, we need to focus first on the top half of the heart. Here are the two atria beating normally in the normal heart rhythm, called sinus rhythm. What makes the top chambers squeeze in that regular pattern is a little spot that lives in the top right part of the heart and it acts like a little spark plug. It generates one at a time a little electrical signal and when the top chambers see that signal they squeeze. And that spot's called the sinus node, also known as the natural pacemaker spot of the heart. And when you're in your normal rhythm, your normal heartbeat, it's called sinus rhythm because every beat is started from that sinus node spark plug area. So it fires off a signal and the top chamber squeeze, and that happens over and over again. When you're at rest or sleeping, the pace of firing is slow and your pulse rate is slow. When you're awake and walking, it speeds up. And when you're exercising or have strong emotions, it speeds up even further because that spark plug is under the influence of adrenaline. When adrenaline starts pumping for any reason, it tells the spark plug to fire faster because you need a faster heartbeat. In contrast, here the atria are fibrillating. It looks like they're having a seizure or they're shivering in the middle of winter in the cold. 
And the reason is that that spark plug sinus node is no longer in control. Instead, there are multiple other electrical spots that start firing in a very fast and irregular pattern. We call them trigger spots and they tell the top half of the heart to start fibrillating and shivering in this very, very, very fast rate about four or 500 times per minute. But again, we can't feel the top chambers doing that because they're so thin walled. There's very little muscle up there as we discussed at the beginning. So the question arises of what makes these triggers show up in the first place. There's a variety of situations and medical conditions that are associated with an increased risk of atrial fibrillation. The most common one is simply getting older. The natural aging process of the heart includes gradual changes that happen in and around heart muscle cells, especially in the top half of the heart, making cells more likely to suddenly start firing and trigger AFib episodes. Being very overweight is a risk factor for AFib, and sometimes associated with that is a condition called sleep apnea, where people may have trouble breathing at night while asleep. High blood pressure and diabetes are also risk factors for AFib, as is heart disease, and included in that category are people with a previous heart attack, those with inherited or genetic heart conditions, or anyone whose heart is enlarged or weaker than normal. Heart failure means that the pressure inside the heart is higher than it should be, and that increased strain on the top chambers is a risk factor for AFib as well. Thyroid problems are also associated with AFib, and interestingly, alcohol is a relatively common trigger that can cause AFib episodes either that same day or sometimes the following day. Sometimes we find no reason whatsoever for AFib to occur, especially in younger patients and those without any other medical problems or heart conditions. There may be things that are present that we just don't have the ability to detect, but it's not uncommon for people to have lone atrial fibrillation, which means AFib with no other cause that we can find. In addition to these trigger spots, there are also areas of scarring that form related to all those conditions, including natural aging. I'm not going to get into that very much in this talk, but it's important to recognize that it isn't just firing trigger spots, but also this scar tissue that allows episodes of AFib to continue for longer periods of time. People may call it substrate for atrial fibrillation, which is a fancy term that means it's something that allows the AFib to happen for a longer time. And it's just another ingredient that sometimes we can target when we're treating atrial fibrillation, which I will talk about in another lecture. One question that comes up is whether you can detect AFib by counting your pulse rate. And the answer to that is sometimes. And we'll review why it's not a surefire way to diagnose AFib to simply count the number of beats per minute. So here is an example of atrial fibrillation with a pulse rate of 40. The top chambers are shivering like always in atrial fibrillation, but the bottom chambers are squeezing in an irregular pattern, but pretty slow. So if you counted your heartbeat here and counted 40 or 50, you might not realize that you're out of rhythm unless you happen to notice that the pattern was not regular. People who have atrial fibrillation without a fast pulse, without the bottom chambers beating fast, still may have symptoms. And the types of symptoms that they will often describe include feeling tired or weak, or notice that something's not right in their chest. They're aware of a funny heartbeat feeling. They may feel short of breath. They may find that they can't exercise because the heart really isn't as efficient when the top chambers are shivering like that and not cooperating with the normal heartbeat. But many people have no symptoms at all 
and they only discover that they have AFib with a not fast heartbeat when they go into the office for a checkup and someone listens to their heartbeat or does an EKG or when they have some type of heart monitor done that detects this rhythm and they were unaware of it because they had no symptoms at all. Here's a second situation of atrial fibrillation where the pulse rate is much faster. The top half is doing exactly the same thing, but the bottom pumping chambers are squeezing at a much faster pace, in this case at 130 beats per minute. Somebody in this situation where they have AFib with a fast pulse will potentially have all of those same symptoms I just mentioned when somebody has AFib with a normal pulse rate. But in addition, because of the fast heartbeat, this person may also notice a racing heart sensation. They may feel their pulse fast in the wrist or the neck if they take their pulse. They may feel lightheaded if the heart is racing too fast. They may have chest pain. Or again, they may feel no symptoms at all. I've had patients come to the office with a heart rate of 170 or 180 being told to come to the office because there was something wrong and they felt perfectly well and were surprised when I told them they had atrial fibrillation. We don't understand why one person feels their AFib and another person doesn't. And it's not directly related to how fast the pulse is going, how fast the bottom chambers are going. So the question comes up, what makes the bottom half of the heart go fast or slow and therefore give you a fast or a slow pulse rate when you're in atrial fibrillation? Because in AFib, regardless of pulse rate, the top half of the heart is doing exactly the same thing in each situation. So as the top chambers fibrillate, they're bombarding and sending electrical signals really at a fast pace down toward the bottom half of the heart. However, there is a natural electrical barrier that lets none of the signals through from top to bottom. You can think of it as a wall, or I'm drawing it here as a river that lets no signals through, except there's one little place that electrical signals can get across from top to bottom and it acts like a little bridge. So every time one of those signals finds a way to get across the bridge during atrial fibrillation, it makes the bottom chambers beat. And some people have a really good fast bridge, and some people have a slower bridge. And we'll get into treatment for atrial fibrillation in another lecture to talk about how we can impact the bridge as one strategy. But this bridge is called the AV node, and this is the reason why some people have a fast or a slow heartbeat in atrial fibrillation. It all depends on that bridge and how many signals get across to make the bottom ventricles beat at a fast or a slow pace. So that's all for this introductory video on atrial fibrillation, and I hope you found it useful. In my next video, I discuss the treatment options for atrial fibrillation, in particular focusing on symptoms. We'll discuss medication options and procedures, including something called AFib ablation. In order to find that video, you can click on my photo and that will take you to my YouTube channel, which is called Dr. Joshua Cooper Arrhythmia Education. And there's a tab you can click on called Playlists, where you'll find a collection of patient education videos. If you're looking for care for atrial fibrillation for yourself or someone else, at the top of my YouTube channel page to the right, there's a small link that you can click on in order to schedule an appointment with our arrhythmia team. Thank you again for watching.